You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with none other than Jamie fucking King. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, really honored to have you talking to me today. For those of you who don't know who Jamie King is, I'm honestly surprised that you listen to my show <laughs> because if you look through the catalog of the albums that Jamie King has worked on, it's a veritable who's who of extreme and progressive metal bands that have made huge waves over the last decade plus. Jamie, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and welcome to the pit. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me, man. Before you became Jamie fucking King, <laughs> you were Jamie King growing up in rural town, North Carolina, I it's, believe? Yeah, rural hall. It's a H-A-L-L. Oh. Yeah, it's a kind of an interesting thing. It's there's a, I think there was a post office in this small town back in the you know, late 1700s or something where you know, it was, the I guess, the, the one of the train stops. And it's just, yeah, it's kind of a weird, uh, long, you know, historic story or whatever, but... Uh, yeah, the place is called Rural Hall. It's a slight north of Winston Salem, and uh, it's basically only ten minutes from where I actually live now in Winston Salem, North Carolina. So, help me understand your superhero origin story. What was it like growing up in North Carolina? What was <laughs> influencing you and affecting you? And how did you come to discover your passion for music? Uh, well, I mean, it started when I was a kid. You know, obviously, you know, as the name uh, gives clue to, um, you know, I was just a uh, young t kid in the suburbs uh you know kind of uh you know my, my family are you know descendants of farmers and stuff like that so i had that uh, background uh but you know my neighbor we lived in the neighborhood and i was friends with some kids uh some older guys and they would happen to be into music and you know i guess uh beastie boys and you know, from beastie boys to motley crew and then you know eventually to the heavier stuff like metallica and and all that kind of stuff and you know, they were listening to it and let me hear it. And at first I was like scared of Metallica, you know, I was like, man, this stuff just seems evil to me. You know, I, I you know, had to be like six or seven or something like that. When I first heard that stuff. And, uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, that, what that made it intriguing to me. And, uh, you know, I, you know, my dad and uncle played, uh, my uncle played drums. My dad played some guitar and they used to jam in our living room when I was a kid. So I remember, uh, I don't remember really, but, uh, you know, I know that when I was like four, my mother has a, an audio recording of apparently me playing a drum beat on my uncle's drum set to one of my dad's guitar riffs. And, uh, you know, they, they, they said, I, apparently I just watched my uncle and picked it up and could play a four, four beat, you know, even at that age and uh, with no practice. <laughs> and, uh, so I kind of remembered that when I started getting into music and I was like, Hey, you know, maybe I would like to, play some drums i think i remember i was able to do this thing and my parents got me a you know an inexpensive kit for christmas and uh, you know i guess the rest is history you know i got into you know into music as a drummer first you know wanted to be a drummer so who do you remember being some of your idols so to speak in the drumming world oh absolutely i mean obviously tommy lee you know because i was you know first fan you know, probably the first rock band i guess would be uh motley Crue and uh, stuff like that so you know just tommy lee and, and then uh, of course uh Lars from metallica uh, and then vinnie paul from pantera nick menza from megadeth i started getting into, into the more progressive element of music and uh you know, and then, you know eventually uh you know, probably by high school i was you know, listening to dream theater i guess when images of words came out you know it's like full blown into uh more progressive stuff so mike portnoy obviously was a, a big influence on my playing and yeah, and it just kind of got more diverse and extreme from there. You know, I love like you know, Dave Weckl, you know, jam with Chip Corea is like an amazing uh, jazz fusion drummer. And Terry Bozio, who's a, more of a soloist type drummer, I got into his stuff early on. You know, started you know getting deeper and deeper into the uh, the more extreme progressive world of drumming, and uh, you know, and music as well. I love guitar. I still you know obviously I still love guitar riffs and and guitar shred. Uh, stuff you know started getting into you know instrumental you know shred stuff at, at an early age as well you know uh, pretty much got out of the uh the more commercial stuff at the time you know obviously and you know kind of through the uh you know even into the grunge era I kind of like was anti-commercial music you know i wanted to do you know obviously when the you know metallica black album came out and they kind of commercialized and started going in an anti 
progressive route, and I was very upset about that. You know, I love the progressive element of Metallica. Uh, you know, you know with Justice for All, there was a little bit of progressive element there, and uh, when they abandoned that, I was like, oh man, you know. Uh, so I've always kind of been that, you know, the prog metal guy at heart. You know, I love classical music, and I think that's, you know, there's kind of a correlation with uh, progressive musics and uh, the more extreme classical music, you know, in terms of just being more involved uh, harmonically and rhythmically and stuff like that. And they just uh, you know, having a deeper understanding of music, just, uh, you know, that's what made, you know, kept my interest and, in, you know, held my attention. You know. So you were already bitten by the bug of progressive music before you left high school. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was, you know, I, I was, I was actually, you know, I was in various bands, you know, with uh, some people, you know, a guy I uh, met in high school, a couple guys I met during, you know, uh, middle school, actually, you know, we were, you know, we were trying to play like, you know, Megadeth's Rust in Peace in eighth grade, you know, uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty new thing. And, that, you know, it's kind of, that's kind of a progressive thing, you know, not really super progressive, but, you know, uh, more so than like Motley Crue or something like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're trying to play some Slayer stuff. That's fast. But we got in, you know, I got in. My guitar player and I got into death early on, you know, around the human era, uh, individual thought pattern and stuff. We just love that, that iteration of death. You know, they had gone more of a melodic, you know, progressive route uh, with their sound. And that's, uh, you know, we love that. We, we were trying to do projects that were like that. And all throughout high school, you know, you know, I, I you know, we kind of toned it down on the heaviness and got more into you know, uh, you know, Dream Theater and Queensryche, Fate's Warning and stuff like that, more progressive rock oriented stuff of the era. Um, but, you know, that's just because we saw more of a you know, potential for success going that route. Not necessarily that we genuinely liked it better or anything like that, but we just, you know, I saw Death at a small club with 75 people in it and, you know, we had Queensryche playing an amphitheater. So it was kind of like, hey, if we're going to make a living at this, this is the progressive element that we can do. You know, obviously you got your classic bands like Rush and Zeppelin and all these you know, sort of, uh, I guess, quite progressive bands uh, historically. Uh, they were also huge also, but they're all more rock. You know, they weren't as, as extreme as some of the other extreme bands that we were listening to. But, uh, but yeah, so, uh, you know, leading up, I'm sure we'll, we'll come and discuss about, you know, BT Bam, but, you know, I was kind of into what BT Bam does now. You know, even in ninth grade, tenth grade, that was my jam. You know, uh, these crazy prog bands who do all different styles, and uh, you know, it was just kind of like that union was kind of meant to be, almost. You know, <laughs> and the nineties, growing up then, uh, th that was a very confusing time for metal. I mean, oh, nobody yeah. really knew how to market it, and. Uh, <clears throat> It was just a whole bunch of different styles going on. Nobody knew what to call it. And you were in a band called Swift. Yeah. Uh, and you guys are trying to figure out how to work, but you uh, had a lot of trouble trying to get a good recording. And so you eventually just took it upon yourself to get a good recording out. And you guys had a lot of good success with that. Also bringing you a lot of attention from other bands like, wow, can you get us to sound like that? So you guys just had a 20th anniversary last year. December, didn't you? Yep, absolutely. Yep. How 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 was it? Uh, it was great. Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, you know, we never had any notoriety or uh, you know a large fan base else other than here. But in, here in Winston, you know, um, we we promoted really well. We had a lot of success early on. I mean, there was uh, I want to say there were uh, close to nine hundred people there or something like that. Um, wow. So yeah, I mean, it was uh, you know even twenty years out. You know, uh, the show before that was like. 1100 um you know it was like in 2013 you know it was a, largely like a novelty thing for a lot of our you know the kids you know when they were kids they liked our band and stuff like that we were popular in the local high schools and uh you know colleges and stuff around here so uh you know when we played locally we, there would usually be 500 to a thousand people um you know in at the local venue when we played here um but then we became pretty much inactive in 2005 and just kind of did reunion shows every once in a while. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it surprised me because I, you know, we're, we were kind of expecting like, man, there's going to be like two or 300 people there because, you know, this, uh, this area, also this area, you know, hasn't had a, has, hasn't had a decent, uh, venue in, in probably five, uh, I think the, the venue that we played 
uh, had shut down previously in like 2015, 2014, 15, something like that. And uh, so we hadn't had a venue in some years uh, here in Winston. So there were no local bands playing anywhere. Uh, so we were actually, you know, surprised, you know, pleasantly surprised that, you know, people actually came out and you know, supported it. And, you know, it's, you know, it's like a family reunion for us, you know, a lot of our old friends and fans and stuff and, you know, family coming out and all that kind of thing. Yeah. It was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. It's not, like I said, we don't really, uh, you know, we're all individually into different styles of music at this point, you know, in life, uh, than we'll, you know, than what my old band did, you know, back in the you know late nineties. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Good exercise for me. I'm always trying to look for ways to get out of the basement and do some physical activity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So you mentioned before uh, BT BAM and obviously I was going to get to that a, a sooner or later because when I first heard your name is when I listened to the album Colors. Gotcha. And I'm, I'm sure that probably puts you on the map for a lot of listeners. And I was listening recently to an interview with BT BAM and Paul was saying that while they're writing the material, they kind of weren't so sure that it was going to like, they were kind of like, I don't know, this is a little different, but then he said he sent it off to Jamie King and Jamie got back and said he absolutely loved it. And it was like getting dad's approval. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, now we're confident in this album. When you heard the material and you were working on the album, did you have a feeling like this is something kind of special? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, of course I've been a, you know, BT Bam fan and before, you know, I mean, I recorded their first record and, yeah, I mean, I love the stuff. You know, I I had I used to do sound for them when or some of the guys in the band when they were in a band called Prayer for Cleansing at a local venue. You know, it was, you know, it was back in there, fifteen kids there, thirty kids or whatever, doing karate, mosh, whatever stuff. <laughs> you know, days. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, so you know, I was a fan of that band, and then when BT Bam, you know, came to me to record, I'm like, this stuff rules. You know, and I I remember distinctly saying, I'm like, you know, asking them like, why do you do this style of music? Because at that time, you know rap rock and new metal was at its height, you know, the progressive, you know, intricate stuff wasn't even, there was no market for, it, you know, and my, you know, my band Swift was, you know, was an attempt to create something that's heavy and melodic, you know, there's, there's elements that we love, but make it marketable. So we couldn't really, you know, it wasn't progressive at all, really, you know, minutely progressive, I guess, in some way, but we didn't do guitar solos and things like that. But here BT Bam comes in in 2000 and they're doing guitar solos or doing different genres of music. You know, they got power metal moments and Southern rock moments. You know, a bunch of stuff at the time was considered passe and just, you know, this, uh, particularly uncool, you know. You know, they had elements of the early death. You know, I mentioned death earlier. They had early elements of early death metal and grindcore and black metal. I mean, all these, this fusion of all this, this variant stuff that I loved, you know. And plus they had jazz moments. They had. I mean, it was just, it was crazy to me. So, you know, that the fact that they were doing it and, and, and the stuff was actually good, you know, it had catchy moments and uh, great grooves and melodies and things like that. And I was, you know, so I was blown away. And then, you know, so I've been working with them since they did the silent circus um, record next, but they didn't record that with me. The, I guess victory had their own ideas as to who they should record with. And um, so when they were signed with victory, the first record with victory, they, they did someone else. And, uh, uh, but they came back to me to record Alaska and that, that kind of, I, I noticed they were kind of, uh, adding more and more of the, uh, I guess the prog element to their music, like the classic prog, you know, uh, King Crimson and, you know, uh, you know, Pink Floyd even and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and, you know, I was like, man, this is awesome too. You know, this is like next level. So to me, colors, when, you know, colors came along, it was like, it was just kind of a logical progression for them. They were adding those elements to the music already. Uh, but I think, uh, I don't know if it was conscious for them, but I think honestly, it was, it was definitely risky for them to, to kind of tone down some of the more extreme elements and go more into the, the prog realm by ratio uh, of material. Uh, and actually do more rock and, and, and other, you know, uh, I guess more palatable styles, you know, in the material. But, you know, like I said, myself being a fan of all different genres and, you know, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of good song crap. You know, I, I'm a big, you know, I love Weezer, for instance. You know, a lot of people are like, <laughs> really? You like, but I mean, BT Bam, you know, also they grew up during the alternative era. You know, they love like, you know, Weezer and, 
Alice in Chains and all this stuff. And they, they kind of did, they started doing a little bit more of that stuff. And uh, so for me, creatively, like as a fan, I, you know, I was stoked to hear the material. I was honestly, you know, kind of skeptical. It's like, hey, are your fans going to like this? As they were, I'm sure. They're probably like, man, I don't know if of our established fan base is really going to love this. And uh, and I was honestly like, I, I wouldn't have, you know, as a producer, if, if someone was like, hey, do you recommend this band make this move? I probably would have been like, no because you're going to probably alienate a good portion of your fans you know because their earlier stuff was had a lot more hardcore and a lot more death metal a lot more extreme element and uh but at the same time you know i knew the stuff was great material you know uh, and uh you know it was just kind of one of those things i mean there wasn't a lot of thought on my end you know i just you know my only goal for them has always been to try to capture their vision whatever that may be each record you know and and they've had you know, every record, I mean, they were really open-minded, like, hey, let's try, let's try this amp, let's try these, these drums, let's try, you know, there's no, like, hey, let's go for this specific sound. They just want to sound the way they sound in that moment. And, uh, and you know, I'm there to facilitate it to the best of my ability. And obviously, early on, you know, I, you know my ability was uh, on the lower end of things, in my opinion. Uh, luckily, we were able, we were able to uh, do some remixes here lately to kind of, uh, you know, rectify some of my shortcomings in production and mixing. Um, uh, but, you know, at the moment, you know, it, it just kind of coalesced in a, in a, that at that time I was actually making leaps in terms of my production, you know, my ability, you know, um, you know, I finally had a full, you know, a, a full blown pro tools rig that was capable of doing the production uh, that people were accustomed to hearing on records and, uh, you know, I bought some better preamps and, and some mastering gear and things like that. And uh, uh, so it's actually probably it, they came in with one of the, the, you know, with that great record at the same time that I finally had stepped up my game in terms of production and, uh, you know, mixing and mastering and stuff like that. And, uh, and it, you know, ended up being uh, quite listenable. So I think, uh, you know, it was just, uh, it worked out on all ends, just kind of magically, accidentally. You know, uh, you know, uh, they honestly, in my opinion, I mean, I've told them this. I mean, I feel like they they probably could have, uh, you know, uh, you know, move forward quicker if they would decided to work with someone else. But I think it's just, you know, I'm a hometown guy for them. Uh, you know, we're like family, so it's kind of like it's really comfortable, and that's important to them. And you know, work ethic and and all that stuff. You know, other than just the audio stuff is important to them. And uh, you know, and also I think, you know, probably having some some degree of control and trust that whoever they're working with is going to deliver what they want and need is important as well. Uh, so the relationship is, uh, you know, has been uh, been, I guess, solid and constant for you know 20 going on 20 years now. Well, when the formula works, why would you mess with it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's I mean, there's a big thing, you know, uh, there, you know. BT Bam, I mean, as inspirational as they are material wise and performance wise and all that stuff. I mean, they're also inspirational individually as people. You know, I think uh, a lot of people don't, I mean, may not know them personally, but, you know, uh, they're high integrity. They're very disciplined. And, but it's saying, you know, having said that, they're, they have good time and, you know, they're laid back and chill and realistic, you know, about life and things like that. And it's like, for me, it's, you know, it's like, you know, they're one of the most successful bands I've worked with. And, you know, it just happens to be some of the coolest guys uh, that I've ever worked with and some of the most talented musicians. It's just crazy that it work, has worked out like that. And, uh, and I'm definitely grateful for it. And, uh, but, yeah, like I said, I mean, just uh, they working with them and the fact they keep choosing to work with me is, has been a constant motivator for me to get better, you know, because I want to do to do my best work and, and provide them with the best product that they can provide. So, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, honestly, I probably wouldn't be where I am skill wise and, you know, certainly equipment wise, if it wasn't for the fact they were choosing to work with me, you know, it's like, they're like, Hey, we're going to do your next record. And it's to me, I feel like it's, it's a big responsibility. They've got fans worldwide and uh, you know, the stuff is amazing material wise. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want the production and all that stuff to be the hindrance into their success and, to the reach of the material and stuff. So I, I just constantly, you know, I try to get the best gear I can, you know, I can afford, I try to, to constantly learn and, 
And like I said, I see they, they do the same thing personally it's on the instrument and the material wise, they constantly try to take things to the next level. And it's just, it's inspiring. You know, it's just, uh, I think it's, you know, I think they see that I try really hard also. And, uh, you know, I think that makes them maybe feel more com comfortable and, uh, you know, uh, I guess at ease, uh, you know, about doing the record, you know, they can focus on the material and not have to worry so much about, Hey, are, are things going to be done? They've honestly tried recording or working with other people in the past, you know, under record label, uh, you know, recommendation and things like that. You know, people who have Grammy nominations or Grammy wins and all this other stuff. And, you know, the, the experience was not, you know, all that positive for them. I think, uh, you know, the people who try to f push their creative input on the band or, you know, uh, you know, and, you know, just they don't they don't feel as comfortable or confident in uh, that, that they're going to get what they want, how they want and how they need it, you know, and things of that nature. So, uh, but, you know, now they've, you know, we've been, they've been working with me and now they're working with, uh, you know, Jens Vogren, who's, a, you know, obviously a master, uh, you know, master mixer, producer, master guy or whatever. You know, he's got you know, probably 10 years on me experience in terms of just mix. He's been mixing and mastering for probably 10 years longer than I've, I've been even in the business. So, <laughs> uh, so now they have him on board, you know, things really are, you know, even another level up, you know, and, uh, but yeah, and I mean, that's really special. I think how you guys have that relationship that to kind of push each other and inspire each other to keep working harder and, you know, getting better. And a lot has changed over the last 10 years in terms of just recording. I mean, I know for you, you probably are doing a bit less actual tracking and more just mixing. Right. And absolutely. Uh, everybody's doing di guitars and i think about i think back to about 10 years ago and i remember that's when gent was just starting to get on the scene some people were laughing at it and some people were trying to wave the flag and to me gent in a lot of ways kind of represented the pinnacle of production and over production in yeah. metal music you know everything was so compressed there was just no life in anything anymore. And then now there seems to be like I'm witnessing a counter movement where some bands, they'll release a, a version of their song just playing it live in the studio all stripped down. And that might actually get more views on YouTube than if they would have made a music video. And bands like Opeth are stripping down. The last Meshuggah album was recorded live. So what do you think about this trend? I love it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, of course, I love, uh, you know, production. I love, you know, nice, clean record but yeah things you know a couple some years ago had gone too far i think and then some people have been going too far um you know with the production in my opinion you know uh, and i've mentioned this before in other interviews and things but you know me you know i, I feel like metal music rock music especially progressive rock and metal you know is traditionally a performance-based art that's kind of the point you know to me it's like it's musicians uh wanting to listen to other musicians do amazing things and, uh, you know, when you're basically everything's in the computer, like you, you take a drum performance and you just, you know, you replace all the hits with samples and, you know, uh, you know, uh, quantize, you know, any, any human, uh, rhythmic element out of it. And, uh, you know, you do the same thing with the guitars and, you know, and, you know, enlarge, you know, the tune, you tune in the vocals to the point where, it, you know, it's not, you know, basically the product, the recorded, the record uh, is really not a record anymore. It's not a, rec you know, recording, it's a programming, you know, they take some input from your stuff, I guess that element of recording, but then they manipulate it to where it's just a programming with your recorded materials. Almost. And that'll literally be the credit on the album. It'll say programming by so-and-so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it should, if you're going to go that route, that, you know, teach their own, you know, and you know, obviously there's still a lot of people who love that gent and aesthetic, you know, that super, you know, it's, it's larger than life, uh, you know, drum sounds, it's, it's inhuman, uh, the guitar is inner, you know, subdivisions and cleanliness and all this stuff. And it has an aesthetic that is pleasing to a lot of people. And I get that, uh, you know, it's, it's just like all the CGI movies, you know, it's like, there's, there's a thing about it that, that a lot of people dig, you know, and that's fine, you know, but I do believe like that people should have some integrity and, and, you know, if the record is fake, then just, I mean, if a record is programmed and there's not no performance left, then didn't say that, you know, it'd be like, you know, uh, you know, 
you know, perform, you know, at this, you know, you can't, if you list the band as a drummer and it's like all program drums, it's like, man, that's, you know, don't even, you know, say the live drummer is blah, blah, blah on the record, you know, is, you know, superior drum, you know, whatever the producer, whoever, or the engineer who actually programmed the stuff uh, could be written by blah, blah, blah. And program by, you know, <laughs> to me, it'd just be more accurate. You know, it's, you know, I think most people, you know, most musicians can hear these things. They're like, Oh, that's not real drums. And it's like, to me, you know, when I was younger, listening to progressive music, I would hear a new record. I'm like, wow, you know, like dream theater, like that guitar solo is so fat. It's so ridiculous. You know, and you get stoked on it. Or I heard Vinnie Paul do the, the kick drum patterns and, uh, you know, and far beyond driven. And like for the, you know, I hadn't heard anything like, that, you know, stuff like that. You know, when I heard that, I was like, man, that's awesome. You know? And, uh, you know, you get stoked on it because, you know, you, you assume that that's real, you know? And then of course these are artists back in the day, you know, also you go see them live and they could play it. They recorded it in the studio and then you see them live and they can perform it live pretty, pretty close to it. You know, they might have their best possible take on the record. Uh, but you know, there's an approximation of that live and then, but you know, fast forward, you know, 10, 20 years or whatever, and you get this whole, you know, there's some artists is like, okay, you know, that record was recorded at quarter speed, slowed down and then sped up, you know, this, 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 you know, stuff that makes the, you know, the performances sound like amazing and superhuman. And, uh, and then you see them live and they're not even close. I mean, it just doesn't even sound like the same band. And it's just like, uh, it's just, you know, and, and knowing that as a, as a prog music fan, it's like, it's hard to, st hard to get stoked on, uh, you know, records like, you know, for instance, Meshuggah's Bleed, when I heard the, heard that record, I was like, this is amazing. But it wasn't like it's mind blowing because I knew it was quantized. You know, I knew it was like pocketed or whatever. What blew my mind was when I saw the video of them playing that song live. And I was like, they can they're actually playing this like this is ridiculous and they can do it. And these dudes are like pushing 50 years old. I'm like, this is and it gives me chills just thinking about it right now. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's the performance element. This what does it for me and for a lot. I think a lot of metal and pro prog music fans, you know, and it's like. If the record doesn't have that, you're just doing the whole genre. You're doing your material disservice, all that stuff. It's like, yeah, it takes more work. It takes more effort and sometimes more money to to capture some good performances uh, of this crazy material. But it, at the end of the day, it makes it more valuable. It gives it more value. You know, it's like and I think, you know, I think if metal and progressive music is going to continue to exist, I think, you know, I think it has to have that performance element. I think, like you just mentioned earlier, a lot of people are recognizing this, and there's a movement, you know, all of those, and including myself, who, you know, who have gone over, you know, overboard with the production editing and the, and the studio and the computer magic stuff. I think we're all realizing, like, that was, you know, has always been a mistake. We probably shouldn't have done that, and let's dial it back and, Let's, uh, let's get some performances and put some, you know, and, and put that out there. You know, I think, uh, you know, it might technically not sound as high fidelity or, you know, or whatever, but it's, you know, I think the feel you can feel, you know, I think that's one of the things that about between the Barry to me and some of the other bands that I've recorded, you know, it's like, it's very, you know, I, you know, if, if the band is good, it's going to sound good by default, you know, quite easily. It's really not a lot of work on my end. And, uh, uh, but you can also feel it. There's a three dimensionality that's there uh, that doesn't exist when you're using, uh, you know, a bunch of samples and, and all this other stuff. And, uh, uh, and I think it just, you know, it, it, you know, it feels more, you know, obviously live is the ultimate. You got the sheer volume and all the people in the room and all that stuff. That's the ultimate feeling and, you know, uh, experience or whatever. But I think a record can, uh, you know, can kind of give you that, good feel as well you know if if it if it is recorded properly and that's what i try to do you know basically you know it's like i do do some production editing things like that uh but it's you know try treat it try to be artistic and 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 have integrity about it like i don't i really try to recommend that clients don't do this you know quarter speed slow down stuff i'm like let's at least get a performance you know we might take it in chunks or whatever that you, you know, stuff you can't do live but uh, at least you're you're capturing moments and and and, and good performances and that's in there and I think uh, people can uh, people can sense that they can you know they don't know what it is that's different about it they just know it feels better you know something about it speaks to them more you know I, that's how I feel when I listen to like an old 
album by Yes or someone mm-hmm. like that. Every now and then you'll hear like a, a note will buzz or the, you know, the rhythm will be a little off time in the spot and you just, you accept it. You go with it. You're like, that's the recording. That's what Yes sounds like. You know, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, like Led Zeppelin, you know, Jimmy Page is pretty sloppy, but it doesn't matter. You know, it was like, that was that, you know, that element, he was just rocking and it was just, uh, you know, it was nothing bad, you know, this super bad, you know, there's nothing that jumped out. It was like, oh man, that sounded horrible. But, you know, at the end of the day, to the, especially to the average listener, they don't know. You know, they don't know, what, you know, how difficult it is to sweep an arpeggio or do this other stuff. You know, just as all, you know, but they, you know, I think they can feel in general, they can kind of get a general feel for it or whatever. And it's when it's, you know, when it's when the programming and all that stuff is too precise and, you know, the performances are too flattened, you know, dynamically and, uh, you know, I guess uh, texturally, then it's just. Like I said, it's just something about, it's almost like, you know, the, you know, I've mentioned the analogy before with, uh, you know, it's like, think about trying to get a computer to sing the lyrics of a song, you know, it's like how <laughs> it, it, it could probably approximate some of the emotion, but it's not, there's so many nuances in the human, you know, voice <laughs> and with singing that you, you would have to have some insane supercomputer to, to really be able to do that. And, uh, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just beyond silly at this point you know you like the drum programs have gotten better and better and you could spend hours and hours and hours programming and get it to be more human but it's like why don't you just get a human to do it <laughs> you know? uh, there's great players out there and uh you know i guess the money you know whatever but if you really calculate your time into programming it then you probably could have worked and made the money to pay a good human performer <laughs> you know it's just i don't know it just it got, it, it got to a point where it's just like silly but local luckily i see it kind of dialing back and uh, you know i'm thinking largely i'm kind of you know benefiting from that because a lot of the you know people who are uh, going to these a lot of the super processed uh, you know engineers and producers are going that route and things like that they're kind of seeking out like hey we don't want to do that anymore let's and then I've always been there kind of doing the straddle the fence. Like it's kind of raw, but kind of produced, uh, you know, kind of sound. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, I've always felt like it's, it's kind of the sweet spot in there. You know, it's, you can hear everything, but you know, it's basically going to sound like the band live, but on their best day with the best takes and tones and things like that. You know, it's not going to be some computer created uh, product, you know? Uh, when you were in the studio, I just thought of this, question silly question just now when you were recording an artist that you are honestly seeing an incredible performance come out of and they just they just nail it do you ever get tempted to just be like great do it again (laughs) just because you want to see them do it again oh no absolutely not (laughs) no i mean but honestly no yeah if if i you know because it's it's honestly a luck thing you know i i I, yeah that's we're always against it you know as far as time wise you know and i I, (laughs) You know, I find myself the other way around where it's like the artist feels like it's not good enough. But I'm like, dude, that's the one I'm telling you, uh, you know, it's like that felt good. It might because they might have felt like something their hand slipped on the drum, guitar or something like it might not have felt right. But I'm like, dude, listen to it. You know, it has a good feel to it because like, you, you, yes, you might be able to technically play it better or cleaner, but it's not going to feel like that one. You know, it's like I, yeah. you know, I tell I tell my clients a lot of times like, you know, with leads are like, what was wrong with that one? I'm like. I mean, I don't try to explain what was wrong with it. There's oftentimes there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I'm listening for the magic. You know, I want to hear something that makes me feel and that I think that other people will feel. And, uh, you know, and sometimes that's a, a take that, you know, for certain styles and certain moments, sometimes that is the, uh, the more rigid and more technically correct. You know, sometimes that's, that's the vibe you're trying to maximize, but then sometimes, you know, you want to maximize the emotion and, you know, if the rhythm's a little off, don't worry about it. I can nudge that left and right or whatever. We don't want to capture, you know, we want to capture the, the, you know, just the feel in the strings. We want that human humanity to come through that expressiveness. And like with vocals, same thing with drums. I just, you know, a lot of times, you know, most, a lot of producers like you have to play with a click track. I don't believe that, you know, it's like, unless you're rehearsed with a click track, uh, you know, if you're more comfortable, if you can get a better feeling take, natural like off the click then let's do that you know whatever i can put the stuff to time later you know there's luckily we have these re- these tools and things uh to enable us to to idealize uh things more so uh while you know capturing a 
a great take quicker. You know, like back in the day, you had to do, you had the nail, you had to get a good feeling take that was also in time and also in tune. And, and every element had to be exactly right. You know, this is how, you know, a lot of classic records take six months, a year to get those magic takes, you know, with uh, you know, some of these classic records that we all know and love. But nowadays you can do that, you know, definitely more efficient than ever, but it's still a time consuming process. So if I hear a take, I'm like, that's the one, you know, this, you know, I would, I'm probably like, let's keep that. Let's move on. We'll come back. If you feel like we need to do it differently later, then we'll come, you know, we'll redo it later. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I, I'm definitely an advocate for, if we've got it, let's, uh, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a kind of an abstract question to ask you. I keep thinking about uh, historical sense of metal, how it's evolved over the, you know, from the early days in the 70s and uh, going through the 80s and 90s up to now. Uh, over the last t decade, I feel like there hasn't been anything new in metal, like and a subgenre. I feel like everyone's just gotten more niche but there yeah. isn't like anything actually new. So please tell me, do you have some sort of crystal ball that you can gaze into and tell me the future? Like what's on the horizon in your imagination? Well, unfortunately, I mean, and this is uh, not necessarily optimistic, but I think we're out of stuff. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, in all reality, I mean, I think. Uh, I'm totally <laughs> cutting this part out of the interview then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, I mean, like I said, I don't want to believe. I want to believe that somebody is going to come up with something fresh and new and really ins inspirational. And uh, uh, But unfortunately, I think, you know, all the riffs have been written. All the drum patterns have been done. All the, you know, uh, you know, basically we've got, we can take things that other people have done and do it in our own way. So I think that's, you know, that should be the focus for most bands, you know, and, you know, in large in part, you know, like between the Verity and me, you know, most of the stuff that they do are all, you know, techniques that were, you know, pioneered and owned by other people. Um, but it's, they, they're doing it in their own way with their own sound, uh, which is, that's where the value is. And that's, you know, it's like, nobody sounds like them. I think, uh, so I think there will be more of that. I think, you know, I think we'll see more bands doing, you know, possibly taking all the different influences and uh, maybe, you know, combining them in, in unique ways. And uh, that's a very positive thing. That's where, where things should go. I mean, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of retro where the, you have younger bands, you know, basically doing the same thing as an older band, but just in my opinion, usually not as good, <laughs> you know, uh, every once in a while, there'll be a cool band who's kind of doing like the old school stuff and they're doing it well. Uh, but. Uh, but yeah, as far as just coming up with new rock and metal, uh, you know, I don't, I mean, I really just, I mean, like what's left. I mean, you got you pioneers like in techniques, like animals as leaders and, uh, you know, who are like trying to, you know, infuse different, uh, you know, come up with whole different playing techniques. You know, you got the, yeah. the, the eight string, you've got, you know, instruments that, you know, have not you know, there's a, a band called others by no one I'm working with right now that, you know, they've got everything, you know, it's like orchestral stuff to, kazoos to i mean just any instrument they can get their hands on it sounds like they put on this record and uh, uh and it's you know created a, a, an interesting piece of music you know and uh, you know, and they do it very well uh, so I, I can see more things like that happening uh but as far as yeah i mean it's as far as like uh you know what can we do this completely fresh with the guitar and drums i don't i don't know you know it's a uh, you know, having said that, you know, do we need, do we need absolutely something new? You know, I, all I want is good. I mean, there's definitely good songs to be written and good, and good stuff. It's just, it's more difficult than ever. And unfortunately, a lot of the infrastructure that bands had, uh, you know, historically, you know, you look at a band like, you know, Led Zeppelin and stuff, you know, they had sponsors, they had the record labels. You look at the classical musician, they had sponsors, they had Kings that paid for, paid them money to just focus their music and I mean, their attentions and uh efforts towards you know writing new better music and stuff like that that doesn't i mean that is hardly exists anymore you know there's no labels or like here uh let me give you uh you know you know two hundred fifty thousand dollar cash advance and give you a hundred thousand dollars to go into the best possible studio with the best possible producer and and create a, a master work of you know music and things like that i mean it's just uh that infrastructure is really what helped a lot of the stuff, you know, that I grew up on, you know, be the, the master, the master works that they are, you know, granted there were a few that kind of like, 
you know, some masterpieces that came out of with, with minimal effort and minimal money. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of it required that, that support structure, you know, that, that, you know, uh, the ability to not have to work, you know, some of the best musicians just are choosing nowadays uh, to not write music just because they got to pay bills. They have families and stuff of that nature. And, you know, there's no, there's no compensation financially hardly for, you know, their efforts these days. So it's like, you know, it's just, it's relegated to like, well, that's a hobby. I'll do this on my own time. And they can come up, you know, a lot of these guys are coming up and, you know, doing uh, cool records, you know, really good stuff. But I can imagine how much better it would be if they could just take, not have to work their day job and uh, really have money to use all the real instrumentation and, and do the real recording that they want wanted to do uh, top-notch stuff that they wanted to do for their project. I mean, I think everything overall would be better. Uh, but, you know, we're seeing it in Hollywood, you know, music, I mean, movies are just regurgitations. It's like they're just trying to maximize profits and, you know, CGI everything and just redo movies that have already been done. And it's like, you know, it's just, it's all about that, uh, you know, that bottom line of profits or whatever. And it, that's not really the best thing for art, you know, oftentimes, you know, so not to be a downer, but that's just, <laughs> I don't see that trends changing anytime soon. You know, you've got your dude from Spotify who's got so much money. And then, you know, us artists, you know, we, we only make like 0. 0.0003 cent per stream, you know, and it's just like, that's doesn't amount to anything that's going to, you know, enable us to take time off work. And, you know, unless you're one of the huge artists and those are artists that were most of the huge artists are the artists that were promoted 10, 20 years ago. Uh, you know, BT Bam are kind of grandfathered, you know, they had you know, as much as people want to hate victory, victory made them famous to a large degree. You know, they, they put their stuff out there and helped them buy onto some tours and things like that. A lot, you know, a good bit of it was BT Bam's hard work, but without that infrastructure there, a lot of us wouldn't know who BT Bam was or are, you know? Uh, so yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I really don't know unless, uh, unless something changes with, in terms of, uh, you know, revenue, you know, pro, you know, money being made off of some sort of, you know, recording, you know, right now at this moment, we don't have shows, you know, BT Bam and others, you know, a lot of the, you know, the other bands that are, uh, you know, that this is what they do for a living. They rely on the shows, you know, to sell, you know, of the show money and the merchandise they sell at the shows and, and stuff like that. And like, they can't even do that at the moment. So that's even more scary, you know, uh, in regards to what, what, you know, what are the, what are the musicians going to do? Like, I think they, you know, things return within the next couple of years, it'll be fine. But if it doesn't, then, you know, then, you know, maybe BT Bam will decide to stay home and work instead of make music. And that would be a loss to us, all of our music fans, especially prog and metal music fans. Uh, I'm going to change the subject before things get any more gloomy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. I no, listen. there's some, there's some positives. Like I said, I see vinyl sales picking up, you know, CD sales are more, you know, there's uh there's, you know, the, the collect, the collector concept has come back into the fold, which I think is great. Artists can make some more money in terms of that. Um, you know, and like I said, recordings is easy and cheap as it's ever been. So maybe that will help, um, some people come through that would have broken through with the, the old, uh, structure of the label and that stuff. Cause it was, you know, basically it was difficult to get, it's always been difficult to get signed and, and get that support behind you. And a lot of great artists probably got, never got their chance because they just never had a label. So we don't have those barriers now. So there are some positives. So, you know, maybe that will yield some, uh, some amazing art in the future uh, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. But, you know, I personally yet to see it. It seems like it's the, the way things are, are pushing things the other way, as opposed to, you know, you know the, the positive way. But, uh, but I don't know. I mean, there's, you know, been I, think you, I think you made a good point about the vinyl sales. I actually heard somebody told me that vinyl outsold CDs this year. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I hate vinyl sound because it sounds terrible. <laughs> To me, I mean, technically, I mean, there's scratches unless you have like some <laughs> insane, sane ethic and keeping your stuff clean and got a crazy vinyl player and stuff. But it's still lower than all. It's just digital, you know, technically. I mean, you look at the, 
you know, you're talking like 14 bit, you know, at best, that's, that's at the edge of the vinyl. And then it's like 12 bit audio in the middle, you know, it's like, and these people are like, you know, it has a cool vibe, you know, it's a little bit distorted. It's got like the, that analog heat and warmth to it. And, you know, certain styles of music, it sounds cool. But what's very cool about the vinyl, you know, obviously the artwork's awesome. You got that big square piece of art. You've got that visceral experience of putting the vinyl on and just sitting down and listening to music. You know, people have gotten away from that. And I think that's a bad thing. You know, everybody, you know, listen, you're got it on your phone or, you know, used to be iPods or whatever. And uh, I think it's a great thing to just say, hey, I'm going to listen to some music. You know, I think people need to get back to that and to genuinely like process what's going on and enjoy it, especially with the prog pro metal and rock. There's a, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of nuance, you know, you're not going to get it just driving down the road. Sometimes you're not going to hear all the nuances Then you know, you just stop and like, Hey, I'm going to just chill and relax and listen to this, uh, you know, this piece of music, you know? Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that to me is a great move. And I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, these, these sell, the sales trend in, in the, I guess the value of, physical product continues to grow that's going to help the artists uh you know immensely if they can can make some money on on their actual you know music product as well as the show and merchandise you know that's uh, could only can only help things you know in mm -hmm. reality i uh i need to ask you uh just any advice that you would give to anyone out there that's you know just trying to achieve their dreams I and mean, whether they're trying to be, you know, a musician or an artist or a, a comedian, whatever it might be, you've already gone through this process of jumping into the unknown and being willing to fail. <laughs> yeah. and, and so people, a lot of people are just scared to do that. Right. And I mean, maybe you don't have to put everything on the risk and like, you know, go homeless and stuff like that, but there is an element of, going into the unknown and just what advice would you have for anyone like that? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, obviously it's, yeah, just do it. You know, it's uh, especially while you're young, if you've got a, any kind of support system, you know, if you're like, you know, that's how I got into my thing. If I wasn't for, I had supportive parents, you know, I, there's no way I would have been, you know, I was living at home. Uh, there's no way I've been able to put in the time and effort that it took to learn this crap, especially at that time, there was no internet, like, you know, education systems and whatnot. Um, but yeah, man, while you can just, just jump in and do it. You know, I will say, you know, I've seen people make the mistake in my opinion of jumping into some of these things, you know, some of these entertainment based, uh, you know, arts and things of that nature and just put all, you know, you know, ruin their lives, you know, not really try to have any backup plan or ruin relationships and things. I don't recommend that. You know, it's all, life is all about balance, you know, yeah. and the balance changes as you as you go. So when you're younger and you don't have a family, kids to provide for, and a, you know, home to pay for and things of that nature. Uh, yeah, do it while you can, you know, put, put all you can into it, into whatever crap you're, you're, you know, trying to learn. And, you know, to me, I think, you know, every, a lot of people have a, you know, a tendency to kind of look at the success of others and be like, Hey, I need to do that. This is, I, they did that and it works. So I need to do that. And, you know, there's, there's lessons to be learned there and there's things that you can learn from others success to that you can apply to what you do. But for ultimate success, you have to be an exclusive product or service or something. And especially for a recording engineer, uh, for a musician, for a band, you know, uh, I think the focus, keeping your focus on, Hey, I want, I need to come up with something fresh and unique and something that's going to, you know, uh, you know, cut through the clutter. There's a lot of, you know, especially in the music business, there's a lot of music out there. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of recording, you know, uh, you know, people out there, you know, uh, engineer producers. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I'd imagine it'd be the same, you know, comedians and whatnot. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of everything out there, you know, but you gotta, you gotta have something that helps you cut through the clutter. Some people are just born with that. Either they're beautiful or they're just, you know, they're, they're, you know, some people are born with golden ears and can just mix with no effort and, you know, play guitar, you know, but that's not a hundred percent of it. You know, you still have to, you know, have some way, some mechanism to, to, to get known and to, and to really stand out and to catch fire and resonate with the public. And, you know, this, it's, a, you know, it's almost a lottery win. If you do, you know, if you do become successful, even if you have everything, even if you put in the work and stuff, there's tons of people who put in all the effort and do everything right. And they still don't catch fire and resonate 
with the public. So you, I think you have to accept that that's a possibility. And, uh, you know, I think you should be working on a back, a backup plan, something that's more, you know, uh, that you can bank on a little more so in terms of a, a career and for, you know, for your life, for your social, you know, for your family relationships and, and whatnot, uh, you know, stay grounded in those areas. But, uh, but yeah, just go all in and just, uh, you know, it, and also just have fun while you're doing it all. You know, if, you, if you're doing something and it's like, I haven't, this hasn't been fun for a m- months or for years, then just stop or dial it back until where it is fun again. Because if you don't ever make it, then you can at least say, well, it wasn't a waste of time. I had a great time, or whatever, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, for me, it's, you know, like I love, I still enjoy what I do. Uh, but there's aspects that I don't love that is, you know, honestly caused me like, you know, I've got a, like anxiety disorders and stuff like that. A lot of, you know, elements are hereditary. I'm, I'm pretty sure, but, uh, you know, the, you know, I just went, you know, I would work, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I did that for, for years and it's, it's been detrimental to my physical and mental health. And, uh, you know, I was trying to take it to the next level and make more money to pay bills and to buy more equipment and all this stuff. And it's just like, you know, I pushed it you know, too far, too fast. I just wanted it, you know, I wanted to be better too fast. You know, it's like, I should have, you know, in retrospect, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy that I've achieved what I've achieved and where I am today. You know, it's like, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if I wouldn't have done that. But at the same time, it's like, you know, a couple of years ago, I had a massive panic attack and, uh, you know, I, you know, here in recent years, uh, I've realized that if, if I get unhealthy physically and mentally, it could take me completely out of the game. So it definitely wouldn't be worth, you know, all that sacrifice. And I see this happen to bands, you know, bands, they, they, they go too hard, they tour too much. And then by the time they, you know, do have a good opportunity to let the world know they exist, they're already burnt out in tour. They are burnt out. And it's like, when you do have, when things do catch fire, you, that's when you need the energy. That's when you need to put your all into it. It's when, when you do see that potential, uh, of uh of things really taking off and uh and if you're already burnt out if you've already put too much into it too fat too soon uh without warrants or whatever then uh you won't have the the energy to do that you know so i just say yeah but you know i guess the overall uh, advice would be just to keep things balanced just just do it uh do what you enjoy keep it you know do it to the degree that makes sense for you uh health wise and enjoyment wise and all that stuff and uh you know and that's true about everything in life. I think, you know, it's just, just a, it's all about finding a balance that, that works for you. And it's tough. It's not easy. <laughs> Wise words from a person who knows everybody. You've been listening to the Peach Pit. I've been here talking with Jamie King. Do this again someday. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate you having me and you, you crush it, man. You do an excellent job at this. So you're natural. <laughs>